I do ask that you remain muted unless you've got a specific question for the panelists, which you can also enter into the chat and we will respond. Jennifer, maybe as we're waiting, the, the group that's here, um, do you guys want to go ahead and put in the chat where you're where you're tuning in from? Uh, I'd love to know as we get ready to start our session, where's everybody uh, calling from? We have Indianapolis and North Carolina, Manhattan, Kansas. Wow, look at that. We are all over Massachusetts, Maryland. We got East Coast, we got West Coast with California. This is fantastic. Keep them coming guys, this is great. Welcome everyone. Yeah. Um, Jayla, to answer your question, it sort of depends on your version of Zoom. Um, if you're able to see the participants menu, you can hover over your name and click rename. If not, I believe there's three dots or a more button um, in the top right hand corner or maybe along the bottom panel that will let you rename. Or if you can't figure it out, you can send me the name you'd like to be changed to and I can do it from my end. Sorry, you hear my cat. All right, guys, it is time for us to get started. Um, this is Washington and the Whiskey Rebellion. I'm Jennifer LeMay, um, and I'm here with the Internet2 side of things. Um, I'll be the moderator today. And with us, we have Sadie Troy from George Washington's Mount Vernon. She'll be our presenter today. Um, I am going to go ahead and share my screen and go over just a few little um, housekeeping details here. Sorry, guys. Pat, he's so silly. All right. Um, so like I said, this is Washington and the Whiskey Rebellion, which is presented to us from George Washington's Mount Vernon. Um, the session that you're watching today is a partnership between Internet2, the National Park Service, and um, George Washington's Mount Vernon. A quick disclaimer, by part participating in this distance learning session, participants agree to be videotaped, streamed, broadcast, and archived as part of the program series. Recordings of all PPSP sessions will be posted and available on the Internet2 YouTube page. In order to better facilitate the presenter classroom interaction, we want to review a few expectations. Um, I've already asked that if you're joining as a classroom that you change your, you rename yourself um, to be your school name so that we know who we're talking to. For students who are participating via video, um, teachers, you can select a student or two that would like to answer a question, ask a question, and have them come to the front of the room during interactive portions so that we can hear them when they're speaking. For students who are participating only via audio, you can use the raise hand icon if you have um, an answer or a question you'd like to share, and I will call on and help to unmute you um, for that. For students who are participating via the chat box, um, you'll notice that that's the icon that looks like a caption bubble. You can find the chat box there, um, and you can use that to answer and ask questions from the presenter throughout the presentation. And for all of our students, we hope that you take advantage of this fantastic opportunity to interact with our presenters and your fellow students. We're excited to have you here and we want to hear your thoughts and questions. Um, please be respectful of the chat box and the interactive tools. We want to be able to address as many thoughts and questions as we can. So please only use the tools to respond directly to the presenter prompts. And if there's any inappropriate or distracting conduct over video, audio, or the chat box, we will remove you from the program. 
If you'd like more information on PPSP um, or to access the video archives or information on future programs, please vi visit our website that's displayed on the screen, internet2.edu slash PPSP. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand it over to Sadie to take it away. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you all for attending and letting me come into your, your classrooms, your virtual classrooms, your homes. Um, I'm so excited. Um, this is a favorite partnership of ours um, every year. And um, as Jennifer said, please feel free to use that chat and hand raising feature. Um, for all of us here, I'd love to keep this as conversational as possible. I, I love interacting um, and answering questions and having you guys answer my questions as we go. Um, a lot of you already typed in um, where you're calling from, right? We had California, we had Maryland, um, we had Indianapolis, Massachusetts, Kansas, North Carolina. Um, that's fantastic. I am calling you guys. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen. I'm calling you from, oops, all right, well, let's get this in presenter mode. Here we go, from here. I'm calling you from Mount Vernon. So, and this is George Washington's house. Um, so if I'm calling you from George Washington's house, does anyone know what state I'm in? What state I, I'm talking to you guys from? Yes, so Tyler's got it in the chat, if you guys can see that. Yeah, I'm calling you from Virginia, uh, from Alexandria, Virginia. I'm just about 15 miles south of DC, or as they called it in Washington's time, the federal city. Um, so that's really cool. So I'm glad that all of us get to be together and to talk through, um, and to talk about Washington and some of his time uh, together. Now, before I start getting into the program, I'd like to talk with you guys a little bit first um, about the man himself. So this is Washington here. Um, and if you'd like to use the chat or raise your hand, um, why is Washington important, right? Why, why is it important that I talk to you guys today? Why is it important that people come and visit his house? What is he known for? What are why is Washington so famous? Feel free to, to type in the chat. Feel free to raise your hand and Jennifer is gonna help me call on, on groups. Um, oh, it looks like Edgewood Intermediate in our chat put something really important that Brown School followed up with. Yeah, he's our very first president, the very first. We just had an inauguration last week, right? To inaugurate our 46th president. So Washington, all the way back to our very first president. Um, so that's very important, um, a thing to be known for. Um, let's see, other, th other items that people are sharing. Um, Tyler in the chat has something. He, he mentioned Washington being president, but also helping the war for independence. That's exactly right. That's something else that Washington's known for. Um, and Tyler, maybe you can follow up in the chat or does somebody want to help him? What title did Washington have when he was in the war for independence? What was his role? What role did George Washington have? What was his position? Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Tyler got it. Edgewood Intermediate put it in there. Yeah. Providence Christian Homeschool. You guys are all right. He was the general. He was the commander in chief. He was the leader of the forces. So not only was he our very first president in our you know, newly established country, he was the general leading that fight to create that country. Um, so that's something really important about Washington. Um, are there other uh, things that people would like to share about? You guys are hitting on some really great things. Let's see, this is Washington as general. This is him as president. Yeah, Tyler, that's exactly right. Um, you know, Washington's role in the Revolutionary War is one of the main reasons that the American people trusted him so much to vote him as president. That's exactly right. Oh, I like what Edgewood Intermediate just typed in and that's that Washington was a landowner, right? 
And that's incredibly important too. We know Washington for these political positions that he held, right? General, president, um, commander in chief, but Washington, there was also a really big personal side to him. Washington himself considered him a, a farmer first and foremost. If someone met Washington on the street, that's the job that he would say. Um, he was a husband, he was a stepfather, he was a grandfather, um, he was a map maker. Um, and as you can see from this picture, uh, you know, family was really important to him and he was also uh, something important to know about Washington. He was also a slave owner. Um, that is included when we talk about Washington as that landowner, as that farmer. Mount Vernon, that home that I showed you, that picture, um, that was not just home to George Washington. Um, that was an 8,000 acre plantation. Wheat was the tobacco crop. Washington lived there with his wife and immediate family members, um, but he was also the home to 317 uh, enslaved African Americans when he passed away. Um, and so these were the individuals who were out in the fields growing the wheat that provided for Washington's income. Um, making, uh, there were cobblers making shoes that you can see the families wearing, blacksmiths, carpenters, cooks, seamstress, laundry women. Um, so there were a lot of people living and working um, at Mount Vernon. And this is really important to know that Washington, he is this complex individual. There's a lot of information that we take in and a lot of background that he brings um, to the table and to the different challenges that he faces. Um, now I know I'm calling you from his house. And so we could talk about, you know, this personal side of Washington. Um, but what I really want us to talk about today, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and come back to you, um, is Washington's time as president. That was the thing that you guys knew the most about him. Um, and so that's one of the things we're gonna discuss. Um, and so Washington was our very first president. Um, do you think that um, it was an easy presidency and that Washington just skated through with no challenges um, and that we won the Revolutionary War and the country was peaceful, we had our own government and everything was great? Do you guys think that's what happened? Right, no, not at all. Um, Washington himself faced lots of challenges in the very beginning, because remember, this country was just established. It's still growing. Um, a constitution was written, right? That's our founding document that gives our uh, government officials their power. That's what gives them their job. It's what divides our government into how many branches? How many branches does our government have? Does anybody want to? Share that. How many? Right. Oh, everyone's got it. Look, Farmington Falls has it. Brown, Jada, everyone's got it. So yes, it's got three different branches. And so they're all under the Constitution. But in Washington's presidency, the Constitution is so young. The country's so young. People are still trying to figure out the roles and responsibilities of it. And so what I would like is to um, talk through one of the challenges that Washington faced. Um, it's early in his presidency. We, he was just uh, elected for the second time to be the president. And he's facing a challenge called the Whiskey Rebellion. And this Whiskey Rebellion um, is really important because it is about different farmers in Western lands of the United States. Um, when we think of the West Coast today in America, what do we think of? What states do we think of as the West Coast? Right, California, that's the big one. We got people calling from California, California, Oregon, Washington. Um, well, in Washington's time, when he was elected our, uh, for the second time, so still our first president, but for his second election, there were only 15 states. All right, and so the West Coast are, are places like Kentucky and the Western side of Pennsylvania and Tennessee. So that's kind of our West Coast border. 
And those farmers are living out in the country. Um, and they are um, protesting the government against a new tax that was just put on. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna learn about this tax, okay? We're gonna learn about the protests that the American people um, were protesting um, against the government. And we're gonna learn about how Washington handled it. Um, not only are we gonna learn about how Washington handled it, we're gonna decide how Washington handled it. Cause this game that we're gonna, gonna play is gonna, we are gonna take on the role of Washington. We are going to learn about the protests that are happening. We're gonna listen to people that worked closely with Washington, governors of states, congressmen, newspaper journalists. We're gonna listen to all these people that Washington was hearing talking about the protests. And then we're, we as Washington are gonna decide how he should handle it. All right, so we're actually gonna play a game and become Washington. Um, I promise it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, and then we're gonna break down Washington's decision and why it was important. Why am I talking to you about the Whiskey Rebellion? We're gonna do all of that after the game. So what I'm gonna do is I am going to use my screen now, I'm gonna share it. Um, and we're going to play the game and I will control the game so that we can see all the different advisors and hear everything. And what I'm gonna ask you guys to do at the very end is cast a vote. So just cast a vote at the very end to see how you should do it, to how Washington should handle the situation. But here we go, we're gonna play the Whiskey Rebellion. Disband until you surrender the tax collector. Toto Neville is not here. Then evacuate the property. Lay down your arms or suffer the consequences. local militia attacked the home of the tax collector last night in western Pennsylvania. They destroyed everything on his farm. Several people were killed, including soldiers from Fort Fayette who were defending the property. I have endured protests and non-compliance from the citizens of western Pennsylvania for three years, and I fear it will not end with this. What in the state of things is proper to be done? Welcome to the B. Washington Interactive Theater. Soon, it will be your turn to test your leadership and decision-making skills in a crisis Washington faced as President of the United States. Here's the situation. In the summer of 1794, President Washington faces one of the first tests of federal authority. Three years earlier, Congress passed a tax on whiskey in order to generate much-needed revenue for the new federal government. The tax threatens the livelihood of small-scale farmers in western Pennsylvania who distill their grain into whiskey in order to prevent their crops from spoiling during the long journey to eastern markets. By the summer of 1794, tensions reach a boiling point when several U.S. Army soldiers are killed defending the home of the regional tax collector. You are about to step into the role of President Washington. As President of the United States, will you suspend the tax? let local officials handle enforcement, or use military force to quell the rebellion. Just like President Washington, you will have to make your decision under pressure as the situation continues to evolve. You will be able to seek advice from various advisors who represent people and sources President Washington would have consulted. But be aware, they will offer contradictory opinions and you will not have time to hear from everyone. 
It will be up to you alone to decide how strongly you agree or disagree with their advice and whether they will impact your decision as President of the United States. Now is your chance to be Washington. It's your turn to lead. All right, everyone, I'm going to start selecting advisors that we're going to listen to and pay close attention because they're not all going to say the same advice. Um, but take a moment to listen so that you can understand and make your vote later. As the designer of this tax, which is vital to servicing our national debt, the immediate question is whether the government of the United States shall ever raise revenue by an internal tax. The opposition has continued and matured till it has at length broke out in acts which are presumed to amount to treason. The army should be called forth and employed to suppress the insurrection. Whenever the government appears in arms, it ought to appear like a Hercules and inspire respect by the display of strength. We may have the right to send the army but doing so could make the situation worse. The back country of Pennsylvania is a long way to take an army of militia, and there are tens of thousands of armed men in the mountains who have promised to resist. A resort to force will turn the local population against us and start a war. I prefer the complement of peace by every experiment of moderation. Let the local judicial authority run its course. The whiskey tax is the creation of sycophants and aristocrats who use the government to raise taxes to pay for their financial schemes. Rich men corrupt the government while poor men starve. Our hard work pays for their luxury. The whiskey tax. Sir, Secretary Hamilton has sent you a letter regarding the situation in Pittsburgh. Go on, Mr. Lear. A body of 4,500 armed men has assembled in western Pennsylvania, about nine miles from Fort Fayette, with the design of attacking the fort. Death to traitors! Send the local tax collectors to the guillotines! Bear the letters of which your orders to return. We must quiet the rebellion before it rips apart the Union. Notify the frontiersmen that we are sending a commission to mediate a peaceful resolution. In the meantime, all persons are to disperse and retire peaceably to their respective abodes. A three-man commission is en route to Western Pennsylvania to negotiate with the rioters. In the meantime, you have two new advisors to hear from. Tax is unfair on our labor. It is unjust in principle, oppressive in its operation, and impractical in execution. As a tyrannical tax, it must be immediately suspended. I like the comments in the chat that are having people describe how they're feeling. It is the very creators of this tax who have secretly stoked the fires of rebellion to advance their own power-hungry agenda for increasing the oversight of the federal government. These riots could have been avoided. This whiskey tax is unpopular in many parts of the Union, and you should not attempt to enforce it by rigorous means. Sir, suspend this unpopular tax. Sir, the state of Virginia is unanimous and determined to suppress that horrid insurrection in the state of Pennsylvania. A young man at Braddock's Field says there were not 4,000 men assembled there. There were not more than 1,000 guns among them. And if the ammunition had been divided among them, he does not suppose there would be more than one round a man. For my own part, I think it a very easy matter to bring these people into order. I don't wish to spill the blood of a citizen, but I wish to march against these people to show them our determination to bring them to order and to support the laws.
Military force should only be a last resort. Experience encourages us to persevere in a lenient course. If a riot is committed, the rioters can be prosecuted. State officials are capable Sir, this letter from Attorney General Bradford just arrived from Pittsburgh. What news of the commission? The people cannot be induced to relinquish their opposition to the taxes. The rioters in Western Pennsylvania will not compromise. Some have pledged to resist the whiskey tax at all costs. You may consult your advisors one last time, but make haste. You're running out of time to weigh your options. ...capable of prosecuting these violators. Every time riots have occurred in the past, the offenders have been indicted, convicted, and punished before the tribunals of the state. I beg you, let the local officials handle enforcement. The excise law is a branch of the funding system, detested and abhorred by all small farmers. Should an attempt be made to suppress these people? I'm afraid the question will not be whether you will march to Pittsburgh, but whether they will march to the nation's capital in Philadelphia. I deplore the situation of this country. Should a civil war ensue? I earnestly and anxiously wish that a delay on the part of the government may give time to bring about, if practicable, Time's up. Your advisors have spoken. This is a reflection of how much you agreed or disagreed with their advice. As president, it's up to you alone to make the decision. Will you listen to the people of Western Pennsylvania and suspend this unpopular tax? Will you let local officials handle enforcement? Or will you use military force to quell the rebellion? You have 10 seconds to cast your vote, starting now. All right, everyone, use the chat. Type in A, B, or C. Let us know what you're thinking. Type A if you want to suspend the unpopular tax. Type B if you want to let the local governments handle it. Or C if you want to have Washington send in the militia to stop the rebellion. So A, B, or C. Ooh, good voting. The results are in. The group is deadlocked. The votes are evenly split. Now let's find out what President Washington decided to do. In obedience to the duty consigned to me by the Constitution to take care that the laws are faithfully executed, I do hereby declare and make known that I have summoned the militias from the states of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia. They are already in motion to the scene of the rebellion. If the laws are to be so trampled upon with impunity, there, there is an, an end, end put, put at, at one, one stroke. stroke to Republican government, and nothing but anarchy and confusion is to be expected thereafter. I warn all citizens who aid or abet the insurgents that they do so at their own peril. President Washington chose to use military force. He personally escorted the army to Bedford, Pennsylvania. His decision reaffirmed the constitutional power of our new federal government to raise revenue through taxes, even if they proved unpopular in some regions of the country. The show of force was enough to quell the rebellion. President Washington's bold leadership ensured the rule of law and demonstrated that our democratic republic could withstand a domestic insurrection without trampling on the rights of citizens or descending into chaos. All right, everyone. Well done. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and come back to you guys because um, it looked like you guys really got into the into the game here. Um, you know, and I loved the comments that were coming in and we had all different types of voting. Um, I think every, every option, A, B, and C, every decision got a vote. Um, and so I want to talk about this and I, I want to talk about 
um, the advisors, because they're really important to Washington, right? You guys said that he was our very first president. So if he's our first president, how many other presidents can he look to who have already made decisions like this? How many people can he look to who have done this job before, right? Tyler says zero, Farmington Falls, Providence, Christian, right? Edgewood, everyone, he's got no one. He's got no one to look to as to what decision to make. So what Washington did is he turned to these different advisors. And what was it like for you guys to listen to these advisors, uh, to these advisors, um, right? Because they weren't giving the same advice, right? How do you know who, who to trust and who not to? Um, what was it like hearing, you know, different thoughts um, and different opinions? Um, Brown School says confusing. Um, Farmington Falls says interesting. Um, and ooh, Tyler brings in some, he's always detested Alexander Hamilton's ideas. So you're bringing in some of your own personal experience and perspective into this, which is great um, because the advisors were doing the same thing. I wanna pull up a new PowerPoint to show you guys. Um, actually, it's the same PowerPoint, but a new slide um, to show you and talk through. Okay, and apparently we're gonna relook at all these great pictures of George Washington because those are primary sources too. Um, but I wanna talk us through uh, some of these um, advisors because you guys were really taken with them. Um, a lot of you uh, as Edgewood Immediate uh, Intermediate said, um, most advisors wanted to suspend the tax. Um, and a lot of you were feeling that way um, as, uh, as we were playing the game of, of you know, siding with the citizens. Um, and so I know that there were a couple of the citizens who, or a couple of the advisors who were pro um, ending the tax. And so one of them here, this is John Mitchell. Um, he was the farmer. Um, and you can see he was the one that said the excise law, if you see up here, this is his, uh, this is his quote from, from the, the game. The excise law is the creation of sycophants and aristocrats who use the government to raise taxes and pay for their financial schemes. You can see at the very end, he says, this is a tyrannical tax that must be immediately suspended. Um, and you can see right below it. So as we mentioned, these are all real pieces of advice that Washington received. He received this advice from um, the people of Cumberland County through, if you look at where it says primary source excerpt, through a newspaper article. Um, so Washington was reading the article to gain advice um, from the people. And just as Tyler said, he, you know, he brought in his background that he's never liked um, Hamilton's policies. The people of Cumberland County, they're bringing their own experiences into their decisions, right? They're the hardworking farmers who are being taxed. So that background is having a lot of say into what their decisions are. Um, and so that's the excerpt. So it's bringing in those personal experiences. Um, the chat is doing a really great job, which I am loving is like Farmington Falls mentioned, people tend to repeat history. Um, somebody mentioned earlier, Jada, it reminds me of the attack on the Capitol recently. And so that's something too um, that I would love to talk to you guys about. This is something um, I was gonna get to it, but I think we should jump into it now about why these moments in history are so important to study. And it's because of that building upon nature, the legacy that it entails, um, because sometimes things do, you know, show itself um, in different ways into history. So let's talk about our choices. Um, Washington could have suspended the tax let the local governments handle it or use military force. Um, if Washington chose to suspend the tax, um, what would that have, what kind of message would that have sent? What, if he had made that choice, 
what would the how would the country view the new government if it just suspended new taxes that people didn't like? Farmington Falls has it right. It could cause other rebellions, right? If people didn't like this tax, and so the government said, "Okay, we don't have to pay the whiskey tax." But what if then, you know, later on down the line, I was like, "Well, I don't like to pay income tax, so I don't want to," um, and that happens, and then you know, it sets that precedent, sets that legacy. Because remember, the country's so young. I mean, think about if Washington had chose to let the state officials handle it. What does that mean if the national government is giving their power away to the states to decide? Does that choose, um, does that set up different balances of power between the national and the state? As Tyler said, it means the government could be weak, um, right? Because let's think about, as we talk about history repeating itself, history was kind of starting to repeat itself in Washington's moment. Um, let's think about, so one, what was the form of government before the Constitution? Do you guys, do you guys remember? So the Constitution is the document we wrote um, that we still use today for our government. What was the document before the Constitution um, that set up our government during the Revolutionary War, right? We went from the monarchy, that's a really, right? So we fought the war to get away from the monarchy and we set up a new government, right? By using the Boston Tea Party, that was one of our ways of protesting. We left the monarchy and we set up something called the Articles of, does anybody know? It was the Articles of, Go ahead, Farmington Falls. Confederation. I, the name had slipped to me, but I couldn't just yes. the first half and it connected. No, you're right. Yeah. So the Articles, and can you explain, do you know about the Articles Confederation? Who had the power? Was there like, was there kind of a federal executive branch or was it run by states? Do you remember there, who had the power? There was a federal branch, but it was a lot weaker compared to the states. The states had a lot more power. Right, so yeah, so exactly, you're right. Brown School is right, Edgewood. So yeah, the Articles Confederation gave all the power to the states so that they could run the country. Um, and were all the states the exact same? Did New York think the same way as Georgia who thought the same way as Virginia and Massachusetts, right? No, but under the Articles Confederation, all 13 states had to agree on things. So trading wasn't easy, raising money and taxes wasn't easy. Um, and so that's a really hard thing. And so founding fathers like Wa George Washington, James Madison, Benjamin Franklin came together um, and produced and wrote the constitution. So they gave us this brand new government um, where it makes a stronger federal government who can make those decisions to raise taxes um, and, and have more military control. So they have a stronger thing than a power than the states. And so Washington knows this. So he's thinking about all this as he's making his decision during the Whiskey Rebellion, because he needs to define this, right? No one's been in that role before. The Constitution gives a little bit of a job description, but it doesn't fully talk through all the powers that Washington has to establish. So that's one way that they're repeating history and things are in his mind that you guys have drawn past. Um, another, and Tyler, you kind of mentioned it earlier, and this is what I want to talk through with protests, um, is that was something that's really prominent in American history, right? Protests. Um, I mean, think about it. The very first time, you know, we're protesting taxes, we're protesting them against the monarchy, right? This is what our country's established on. What was that saying that they said at the Boston Tea Party and the Sons of Liberty would chant, no taxation without, what is that? Let's see. Yeah, Farmington Falls, let's. Representation, someone just said it in the chat. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Represent, no taxation without representation. Um, and can someone, you can either in the chat or feel free to raise your hand. I got my participants list up. Um, what is, exactly does that mean? What's, what's the meaning behind no taxation without representation? Where were we not represented? Does anybody know? 
Tyler, go ahead and unmute yourself and tell us, where were we not represented? Over in UK. Yeah, right. We weren't, the Americans, the colonists were not represented in the UK parliament. So that's what they're saying, no taxation without representation. That's excellent. Um, they wanted that governing body. And so that's why we, right, we went to war. We set up that representative government. Um, and so if our country was based on protests, um, why is this protest different? Why is the Whiskey Rebellion so different when uh, citizens of our country are protesting um, something they don't like? Um, Farmington Falls, yes. It went too far. They started okay. hurting people. Peaceful protests are fine, but the second protests start to get like violent or turn into a riot, mm -hmm. which sometimes happens with the mob effect, it sometimes has to be shut down because it can't stop itself. Right. So that is something. So that's one aspect of it, right? The the protests turn violent, right? We have our Bill of Rights that gives us freedom of speech. That right. We have we have the right to protest. Um, peacefully, right? It's when things turn violent that that's a problem. And then Edgewood Intermediate, I'd love for you to talk to us too about your comment that says they had representation. Do you want to unmute yourself and explain that for us too? So where were they represented now? They have elected leaders in Congress. in Congress. Yes, yes. So that's another component of it too. What makes the Whiskey Rebellion different from the rebellions of the um, revolutionary time is that the, the farmers in Western Pennsylvania that we just discussed, they had elected officials that were representing them and they legally agreed um, and put into effect this law. It became part of the law, part of um, the governing body that was based on the power, their voting power that put those people in. And so, yes, that is um, an important thing that Washington understood too. This is a big separation because this was a fully represented body of constituents, right, of farmers, put in their elected officials who legally passed a law. That's what separates it, that they were represented and passed in this legal arena. And, and one more slide that I wanna show, and we understand that this is why Washington um, decided to do what he did. I'm gonna pull it up right now because, oh wait, I lost you guys. Here we go, okay. Um, because Washington makes that description, right? Washington makes that comparison because when we look at his response and we have his de decision here up top, um, and then we have the primary source of the proclamation he actually made in 1794, it talks about, I wanna read this middle paragraph here for you, right here where it's highlighted in yellow. Now, therefore, I, George Washington, President of the United States, in obedience to the high and irresistible duty consigned to me by the Constitution to take care that the laws be fully executed. So, wash, right? We know that when we look at our three branches of government, the legislative branch makes the laws, right? The judicial branch makes sure that they are constitutional and the executive branch enforces them. And so the whiskey tax was a law put into place by the represented government. Um, and so Washington knew that he had to, based on his job description in the constitution, faithfully execute that law. And so that's how this decision happens. And as people mentioned, we can see the legacy of this decision many times in history because Washington set that precedent, right? He set that precedent that we were gonna have a strong executive branch that was going to enforce the laws of Congress. We see that in the civil rights movement, 
um, when the president sent in the National Guard to make sure that schools were desegregated um, in states like Arkansas, because that was a legally passed federal law that the states refused to handle or enforce. So the president enforced it for them. Um, and as somebody mentioned, you know, we saw that this past week or two weeks ago, I guess, um, when you saw, you know, the, the violent protest, that's a great connection um, at the Capitol. People were protesting or refusing the legally sanctioned um, setup uh, and, uh, of the transfer of power. And so the National Guard was sent in. Um, it's exactly right. And that's why this is an important topic to study with Washington. I'm gonna come back to you. I don't know what I just did. Okay, hopefully I'm back. But that's why it's important to have these conversations and to study history because just because Washington made that one decision 200 years ago, it's still impacting us, right? It's still transforming how the government is seen and how the government works today and how decisions um, impact our individual lives. Um, and so that's why just this one um, peace uh, is really important. Um, Tyler asked a really great question. How powerful was the militia at the time? Um, so not crazy powerful. Um, in fact, there was no national army really set up at that time. That's why Washington is calling up those state militias to help. This is, he federalizes those in the moment. Um, but this is in the early stages as they're building up um, uh, the military strength and really federalizing it from the different states that had control. Um, so that really is a great question. Um, I'd love it if anyone had other questions they'd like to ask. I know the time is we are hitting our 45 minutes. So if class periods need to leave, please feel free. Um, we won't be offended, but I'm happy to stick around and answer questions. Um, but I hope you guys liked this game and I hope you like to understand, you know, the complexity of the challenges that Washington faced as president and especially the complex, uh, the complexity knowing that he was number one and that there were going to be many, many more after him. And so his decisions weighed uh, even more heavily on him. Um, there are more B. Washington scenarios. So you can face more challenges that Washington faced as president, um, but also during the Revolutionary War. So I'll make a plug for those. Um, I know Jennifer put the link in the chat, so please use those. Um, but otherwise, thank you guys um, for the conversation. Thank you for making the connections. Thank you for understanding um, the connections between the past today uh, and why history is so important to, to be a part of our, our studies. Thank you, Sadie, for your expertise and for um, presenting to us here today. And thank you guys for joining us. Like she said, if you have any other um, further questions, we're happy to stick around for a few more minutes and answer questions. But if not, you're welcome to log off and um, we hope to see you guys next time. Any other questions can be entered into the chat box and we'll get, we'll get an answer to you. All right, let me stop our recordings. All right. <laughs>